the registrar gets hold of one of his flunkies and says, go find out what this guy wants. That would be me. <laughs> and what that guy wanted was to be able to bring 80 to 100 students into a classroom, pose a problem to them, break them up into groups, different groups every day. Some of you have seen scale classrooms, teal classrooms, things like that, and studio physics kind of stuff. Very big in higher ed these days. But all those pedagogies around that stuff, and these things are both an architectural solution and a pedagogical solution, and the pedagogy is tied to the architecture. And you have groups of students that are fixed at the beginning of the quarter and locked. They don't change. There's nine students in a group, three groups of three. He wanted to have groups of two one day, groups of eight another day, groups of 12 the third day, and different students every time, every which way, right? And he wanted them to work on the problem, and he wanted them to report out. And I'm kind of scratching my head about that. So I'm like, a class filled with freshmen. How many freshmen have the kind of pipes that it takes to talk to 100 people? Because ordinarily, when you're talking to a group of 100 people, you're projecting. You're developing some thoracic tension. You're breathing from the diaphragm. You're presenting. And that's great, everything, except when you're speaking in that voice. That's not an authentic voice. That's barking. That's martial. That's commanding. Um, so we had come across this, this Meyer Sound technology when we were reworking a room that you'll be in this afternoon. Uh, and that room didn't need it. It really didn't have a, a, a good play for it. But when we had the opportunity to take this really difficult space with a 12 foot wide shear wall and three columns in it, 3,000 square foot space, and turn it into a classroom, our model was, well, you know, there's people flipping classrooms these days, so maybe this is the place where people come together and work on things and then report out. And because it was kind of a difficult space and, uh, and the star faculty was wanting this particular thing, which turns out lots of other star faculty wanted as well, <laughs> um, we, uh, we made the leap and, and made the investment and we opened this room fall quarter last year. And so there are a couple of things that we thought coming into it. One was that you would have the ability for faculty to walk around the room and engage with students uh, around the space. Check. We got that. We also thought that it would be a nice space for students to be able to ask questions in because not only can the faculty hear questions being asked, but all the other students can hear it at the same time. So you don't have to do what one person referred to as catch and release teaching, right? Well, what they just asked was, you know, the minute you do that, when you restate a question for something, even if you translate it exactly the same words that they used, it's not their question anymore, it's yours. Um, check on that too, the students could hear it. The two things we didn't expect that, that surprised us. One of them was that the system is transparent. If I had not pointed out that there's something fundamentally odd about the fact that I can walk in this room behind a 12 foot wide soundproof wall and yet you can still hear me speaking in my voice, you probably wouldn't have detected it. And in fact, a group of 12 students that we had in the focus group had not detected. I said something about the acoustics and they all looked at me like, what? There's no piano in here, what? <laughs> the other thing that we found was that authentic voice is really important. That not yelling to be heard in a classroom makes a big difference. And so in an education class last fall, they were talking about some readings that had gone on, and one of the people in the class was very upset about the reading. I mean, really upset. 100 people in the class, person raised their hand, faculty responded to them, and they said, you know, this reading just made me furious. I just reacted to this. And, and you could hear her voice choking up. You could hear it. Everyone in the room was like, whoa. She can't do that if she's yelling to talk to 100 people. Right? I mean, the best thing you can hope for in that kind of situation is that the teacher would be close enough to hear it and would translate it in some way. But the impact on the class of someone having that powerful reaction to some of the content of the class, that's a different thing. We expect that in seminar classes where there's a bunch of people sitting around the table. There's eight people in the group who are sitting around the table. You're close enough to hear when someone's tickled, and you can hear when someone is amused, you can hear when someone is angry, but you can't miss that. But in a class of 100 or 150, that's a different piece. Okay, so you were saying before, I can't talk to my, my people here. 
Yeah, like I said, you're just afraid to interrupt anything. I noticed while you're talking, it's dead silent in here. Nobody's saying a word. But even when we were in the other classroom, you know, I was still kind of making jokes with uh, with the people next to me and stuff like that, you know, making uh, small talk almost. But in here, I, I don't think anyone... This would be a bad room to do that. Exactly. <laughs> so uh, I think it seems to help the teacher get the attention of the students, that's for sure. So let me suggest that we try something. Uh, what I'd like you to do... Uh, if you're if you're not already sitting with, is, are, you, are you sitting with people that you work with right now? No, pretty well mixed up. Okay, great. I'm I'm going to do something, and I want you to um, tell each other what district you're in and how many years you've been there. Okay, we're going to take about 30 seconds to do this, so make sure and go. I'll need a county office at Ed six and a half. County office Ed? Okay. Where are you from? Oh, good to see you. Alameda? Alameda. Okay. Yes, it's kind of wild. It was on your jacket, I saw. Yes, it, it, it does amuse me that I was probably, I was the last one in, yet I'm probably one of the closest people for about 30 years. Okay, let's come back. No, that's yeah, right. Yeah. 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 In the technical details of how they actually work, but basically what they're doing is they're putting a whole lot of reverberation on people's voices. Now, you folks right here probably don't hear much in the way of reverberation, but how about you? You hear it? Yeah. yeah. If I bark, <laughs> right? You can hear there's a lot of stuff going on here, except when you're in your field. When you're in your field, it doesn't happen. It's not tracking me around the room. It's not playing games like that. It's applying a filter over the entire space. So the thing about listening through reverberation is you can listen to one voice with this kind of reverberation on top of it. Not many people can listen to two. No one can listen to three. It makes sense out of it. And so when I asked you all to have conversations, there were as many conversations as there were populated tables here. And the rest of the tables kind of went away. So you can take a group of 120 students, lecture to them, walk around. Oh, but let's make a distinction with the lecture. I don't know about how your eyes are, but 56, my eyes are good enough to see about the first three rows in that classroom we were in before. After that, pretty much, Terry and Cognita, I don't know what's going on. <laughs> Here, if I'm working in this classroom, I can walk around and get eye to eye with every student every day and see, is the light on? Not only is it a bad classroom to have side conversations in, it's a really bad classroom to be shopping for shoes or something on Amazon because <laughs> you know, you don't know where the faculty is going to pop up next. So, in any case, this is uh, a, a one of a kind classroom. I expect it will not remain a one of a kind classroom for very long. Um, one of our one of our newer toys here. Questions. How much did it cost? Three hundred and fifty thousand dollars. <laughs> so that's a big number, right? Three hundred and fifty thousand dollars for a classroom that holds one hundred and fifty people. So let's contextualize that, shall we? This is loudspeakers, microphones, and digital signal processing. There's a, a rack of computers in that shelf just going crazy in there. Um, if anyone's interested in like detail stuff, there's some really fun things that it does that, that, that are not immediately obvious. But um, that kind of technology has typically about a 15-year lifespan. If it's not obsoleted by operating systems changing or things that it needs to connect with in the world, then you know it's just doing its thing, and those chips will keep doing their thing for 15, 20 years easy. These being kind of commercial grade electronics, loudspeakers and microphones. Have you ever worn out a loudspeaker? Blowing it out is a different thing. <laughs> <laughs> but wearing out a lot of speaker, 30, 40, 50 years lifespan is pretty, pretty typical. Um, and so, if you'll grant me that in a 150 person classroom, I can pretty easily put between 700 and 1,000 students through here in a quarter, 
give me the thousand students because we'll count only three quarters and not all the summer workshops that take place in there. Thousand students a quarter, three thousand students a year, fifteen year lifespan. So that's what, forty five thousand students. Three hundred and fifty thousand dollars divided by forty five thousand students. It's something less than ten dollars a student for the ability to have ordinary conversations in a classroom of 150 people. This in the context of $100 textbooks. Mm -hmm. And in that 15 year time span, I would have replaced all of the screens in this room three times. I would have replaced the carpet and all the furniture in here at least twice, actually coming up on the third, the third round. So relative to that, yeah, $350,000 is a big number. What's it worth? Hard to say. Any other questions? I don't know why I always end up oriented with my back to the whiteboard here. Have you feedback from students that are hearing Not so much from them. We hear from faculty. Uh, we had David Kelly, who is the person who founded the, the D School. Uh, David taught a course here. He's teaching it again here this year. And he says, you know, we don't have any choice. With the kind of things that we want to do in the classroom, this is the best classroom on campus for us. We've tried all the rooms in the D School. They're not as good. Not, not even close. Um, David was fitted with a hearing aid halfway through last fall quarter. But prior to that time, he said that this was the best classroom for, hear, for him to hear women's voices. That was the, the range of hearing he was starting to lose. And even before he got the hearing aids, he was hearing people a lot better in here than in But with them, he's not having difficulty in here? No, not at all. What do you do with the furniture when you replace it? Yeah. It's, it's pretty sad. <laughs> that. There are exceptions to that. Um, I'll, I'll show you an exception to that this afternoon. Yeah, these, these will do uh, six or seven years. Mm -hmm. They're just worn out when you talk to them. Okay. Yeah, or, you know, they still <laughs> cost money. I don't really know where they go. There's no fixed solution to that. The screens are, are really an issue because they wear out. They are built very inexpensively. They are, uh, and generally you're looking at the, the major uh, manufacturers are flipping through two generations of product a year. And the consequence of that is, yeah, these things are not really built to last. These, these will be done in three or four years. A quick question. So, um, just explain to me the maybe the acoustics in the room. So there, obviously, there's microphones. Are those little speakers? But we're not hearing you through that. Only like when it was reverbing, correct? Okay. You are hearing me through that. Right but now. There's, there's an interesting trick. Actually, all of these round things on the ceiling are speakers too. There's 70 speakers in here. Okay. And here's what's here's the trick that's being played. Um, have you ever been to a concert where they have those repeater speakers? Mm -hmm. right. Yeah. Did you hear the band from those speakers, or did you hear it from the stage? Both. Depends on how much you've been drinking. Both, right? Yeah. <laughs> exactly. How much you've been drinking. Um, it's like the baseball. Yeah. What's, what's going on there is that our hearing has a peculiar characteristic to it. I think it's peculiar because I'm an engineer, I guess. Um, and the characteristic is that. Uh, we locate the sound based on the first arrival of the wavefront. Okay? So if you delay any reinforcement that you may be providing to that signal a millisecond or two, then we hear the sound coming from where it's at, where we expect it to be coming from, from the location we expect it to come from. The reinforcement then comes a couple of milliseconds later, but we disregard that in the purposes of, of locating the speaker. Let me demonstrate that to you. If you were to close your eyes, my guess is you'd be able to tell me exactly where I am in the room. I'd be able to point to me. Right? And so several people are pointing at me. <clears throat> Try that now. I'm going to walk behind a wall where there really isn't a direct path between me and you. And uh, my guess is where I am is not quite so clear right now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I'm back. I'm back in focus, right? And so what's going on there is you've lost that, that initial wavefront that allows you to say they're there, and you're hearing just the reinforcement inside of it. So it's running all the time. Um, 
there's another trick that's been played there as well, right? Because we're, if we want to have a one millisecond uh, or two millisecond delay, the speed of sound is, is what? Fast. Seven hundred. For, for the purposes of for the purposes of, of argumentation, it's about a millisecond of delay. Okay. So what's the right delay for this person here versus the right delay for those gentlemen over there? changes. And so what's going on is there's a one-to-one -one mapping between each one of the 40 microphones and each one of the 70 speakers that changes the delay from that microphone's input to each one of those speakers out there. Right? So that the reinforcement not only is the waveform of my voice spreading out in the room in a, in a spherical way, but the reinforcement is spreading out in the room in a spherical way as well. So, yeah, there's a lot of spoons stuff going on here. So what's running and in there's the some closet? Fun things too. Yeah. Yeah. What's in the closet? A whole lot of processing. A whole lot of processing. You know, where, where, where this came from was a desire to uh, deal with the situation that you run into if you are a school district, for example, and you're building an auditorium. Right? Question one, day one, meeting one is what are we using this auditorium for? Is it for lectures? If it's for lectures, then we want to have a reverberation time of less than a half a second. Two tenths of a second is really cool. If we're showing movies in here, we don't want reverberation, period. Flat out, none. We want this room dead. Think about that. Last time, next time you're in a, in a movie theater talking to the person next to you, think about how hard it would be to talk to the person down at the end of the row. It just, it just doesn't carry. There's a, the room just kind of sucks up sound. That's intentional. If you're doing symphonic music in the room, you want two seconds of reverberation time, so the music kind of blooms out. So when an orchestra reaches their crescendo and then stops, it rings. Right? You, you want that. If you're doing choral music, you want something on the order of four seconds of reverberation. <laughs> ah! Well, that one soured. And, uh, <laughs> and this is actually an interesting thing. Right? If you've been in a cathedral before, you know that you can have conversations with people that you're with, and it doesn't really do that much. But if a little kid screams, ah! everyone in the church hears it, right? There's near field reflections, there's far field reflections, and the computational model that this thing is operating from acknowledges those differences. So, back to normal. Yeah. So, are there any special tiles for acoustics for the feedback of the sound waves of the head off the walls as well? Or just standard stuff? Pretty much standard. Standard roof tiles, standard carpet squares. Every time you see fabric in the room like this, here, that wall, that sheer wall, all around the perimeter, that's about two inches of acoustic material behind it. So you can use this pinnable wall if you want to, uh, but it's soaking up a lot of energy. Conversely, the windows are bouncing a lot of energy back into it, so it's kind of a toss. So I have a question about, if the room is designed for some superstars who wanted a different space, right? And yet, I'm curious about how 